Hello, it's Duncan. Team Guild of Rose is honoured to be joined today by Lucas Ada, the brains behind the Duke SQL Mapping Library. We've previously experimented with using JetBrains Exposed for persistence, but found that it had some idiosyncrasies. So before we go too far down that road, Lucas is going to help us implement the same functionality using Duke. Our pairing is split over two episodes, so please subscribe if you want to hear when I release part two. So, well, hello, it's Duncan, and I'm joined today by Lucas Ada, who is, I don't know, are you um, the creator of Duke, the chief scientist? You're, yeah. you're everything in Duke, are you? Right. <laughs> and Lucas has come along to um, help me understand Duke, um, have a look, compare it to Exposed, which is our current database thing, but maybe you could tell us a bit about Duke. Certainly. So uh, Juke was created first uh, when I worked at previous uh, employers and everyone had their own Juke. So uh, this is kind of the thing that uh, companies did in the 2000s. You had a dynamic SQL and you want to have a dynamic SQL query builder to avoid concatenating strings all over the place, right? So um, you have this API that allows you to write a SQL query in, in Java directly. So this was the origin, but uh, luckily it works very well in Kotlin and Scala as well, thanks to the design of those languages. And uh, with Juke, you can just have a type safe uh, embedded SQL experience as if uh, the Java compiler or the Kotlin compiler actually understood SQL. And by now, pretty much 80% uh, or 90% of all SQL features are supported in the, in the Juke API. And uh, you can write SQL as if it was a part of Kotlin. Uh, that's good for me because I'm, I'm peculiarly rubbish at SQL. Um, I've, I've, I've worked on lots of projects with SQL. Uh, but the last project uh, that um, where I touched any SQL, I accidentally gave away 1.4 million pounds in, oh, no. in a freak SQL accident. <laughs> yeah, I guess that you can't help prevent that. I mean, if you tell you <laughs> to do that, then I will just execute it. But uh, people have told me a lot of times that they've learned SQL with Juke because the Juke API now has uh, all this uh, coverage of SQL functionality and everything is documented. So you can just browse the Juke documentation to discover what SQL features exist, even if you're not using Juke. I certainly find that. I mean, your, your documentation is excellent, and, um, and and looking through your documentation, there was so much of SQL that I didn't realize existed at all because you told me that you supported it. Right. <laughs> so we'll 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 get on some code in a minute. Um, I think uh, for my viewers and you, it's sort of maybe worth sort of recapping where we are with with Gilded Rose. Gilded Rose is a is a stock control system, I suppose, for a um, for a magical goods store, and. Uh, and I'm pretty much the only employee, um, but people join me on the internet every now and again to to help out. And it currently, it runs off a, a tab-separated TSV file on disk. Uh, and the reason for that is sort of historical. Uh, the old store used to run on Excel, and it kind of still does. And we were tasked, first of all, with updating this file every day. So we had this issue that magical goods change their quality over time in in odd sort of ways. And anyone that's done the Gilded Rose Carter will, uh, will have discovered those sort of odd rules. So, so we started off being hired to take this tab separately file and just update it every day so that Excel had what it wanted after a while. And now we're in a position where our, our customer would like us to write a whole stock control system as opposed to managing the rest of it with Excel. So we're looking at introducing a proper database and we've chosen Postgres because Nobody ever gets fired for choosing Postgres these days. And we have an items interface that we have already implemented with the tab separated version and an in-memory version and an exposed version. But um, I found it a bit weird. I found that sort of thread local transactions is a bit strange. Um, there's really not much documentation. There's no support. JetBrains seem to be hiring somebody to take the project on, but it's a little bit um, I feel a little bit exposed at the moment. Ah, exposed. <laughs> <laughs> entirely, entirely undeliberate joke. So yeah. right now it would be good to, it would be good before we were committed too much to, to this library to explore other, other options. And so Lux has very kindly come on to uh, help me understand what Duke could do for me. Um, so let's cut to some code maybe and have a look around, see what we've got already and um, where we can go. 
Okay, so let's have a look. If people have been following this, I've had a little bit of a reorganize of the persistence. So we had everything lumped into this one persistence package, but I've moved it into, there's an event source one, an exposed one, and a stock file one. And we have some tests in here, which are largely this items contract. So this says we had this items interface, here it is. So items has the, has the idea of like taking a block and running it in whatever version of your transaction is sensible for this type of item, mm -hmm. for this subclass of items, which and I guess this is repository pattern effectively. And it has two operations. One is save a stock list and the other is load a stock list. And these have this sort of result type, which is able to, certainly in the case of the, the tab separated one, deal with IO exceptions and that sort of thing. And a stock list is just basically a list of items plus this last modified flag, because we need to know, <laughs> there goes IntelliJ, we need to know when the stock list was last modified in order to establish whether we need to update all the items. This is called from the stock class. And so this stock class's job is to load the stock and if necessary, update it. It says in some sort of transaction, I'm going to load my items. And if I could load them, then I'm going to say, is it now out of date? Because if it's out of date, then I need to work out, I need to go and update this list and then I need to save it. This is the complication around magical goods and the fact that if we just leave them, they either get better or worse over time. But this is not the responsibility of items. It's just that this uses items here to both load and save on our items. So I would like to implement those items, that interface, wherever it is here, in terms of Duke. And I also have a database. So I should say if I'm running Postgres in Docker and I have two databases running, but this test one is the one we're really using at the moment. So that's running on 5433 and IntelliJ is able to see that and connect to it. So it's all, it's all sort of running. So Lucas, over to you. What do you need to see to help me? So, uh, when we migrate everything, I think we should start with uh, the connection or transaction and everything low level before we mm -hmm. do any work on the stock list and item object. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess you can still set up the database with exposed for now. Is that what you're doing? When you initialize uh, yes, the application? So I think in here. Yeah. Uh, or we can exposed. switch that as well. So this is probably so, independent, right? So yeah. you have a pretty simple data source and now in, in order to work with Juke, uh, this database connect object needs to change. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you go, uh, you, you just wrap the same data source, but you wrap it with Juke. So okay. in order to start working with Juke, you just start typing the DSL. There's a DSL class. Did you already add it to the project? Uh, I haven't. So shall I, oh, shall okay. I create yeah, yeah. a package in here then for, for our work? And I'll, I'll start. I, I kind of like to work, right, work in tests because that, that gives me a place All to right. sort of mess around, really. So if I, if I create something in, uh, we'll call it, say, Duke tests, uh, let's put that in here. And we'll just move that to Duke and move the file. And then and for now, shall I just copy this thing? So I've got it in here, one of those. And then I need to import some stuff. So you'd suggested that I start with a GitHub project, which is this one. Right. Uh, so Juke has an official Maven plugin. Yeah. And there's uh, an official Gradle plugin by Juke uh, on the roadmap, but it's not been implemented yet. Partially because Etienne Studer, who's a plugin we're looking at here, mm -hmm. uh, he works for Gradle and he implemented this. Gradle also uses Juke behind the scenes on the ah, servers. Interesting. And it, it's not an official Gradle made plugin. So Etienne did this in his free time, but it's really excellent. He, he knows all his corners and ways around the Gradle and, and knows how to implement, for instance, the task workflow, such that you only regenerate the Juke code whenever something changed and you can configure that relatively easily. So Juke officially recommends you use this plugin for now while you work with Juke in Gradle. The only downside to this is that it's independent. So you always have to manually uh, update the version dependency. Mm -hmm. Right, or so you see that in the configuration example here. You always have to specify the Juke version, 
And this can be some sort of roadblock to beginners when they set up the project, but once the project is set up, it works really nicely. So um, I, I think it's a fantastic idea that every project should basically just have somebody who works at Gradle on their project. Uh, <laughs> that would solve right. so many problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You can tell Etienne, he's uh, maybe has some other interests as well. <laughs> So what I'd done was to actually work my way through these instructions, which I'd say were, were pretty good. So basically it said add a plugin. So that is in here. And then it said add a database driver. And so that's like that. So I can take that and put it in here as a it's sort of, it, it's not really an implementation or it is an implementation. It will be added to the class path in some clever sort of way, I guess. And I guess I should make that match the, the version of Postgres that I was using for Exposed. I didn't seem to need to do this. I didn't seem to need to do this, but I did have to do something on the lines of all this. So yes. let's take that. And we should say that this is about some code generation uh, that we will need sometime, but it's also the quickest sort of easiest way of getting the libraries running nicely in our Cradle file. If we're going to have to do it eventually, we might as well do it now. Is that, is that kind of where we are? Yeah. So uh, I will talk about code generation right afterwards a little bit once mm -hmm. we have uh, some examples to work with, but it's really the, the recommended way to work with Juke is uh, by using this code generator. The idea behind this is that you have a pre-existing database schema that you manage maybe with Flyway or Liquibase or whatever. Mm -hmm. And my opinion is really that your database will continue to exist for decades, whereas maybe your application changes, you're, you're going to switch everything to TypeScript tomorrow or to Rust in a month or whatever, but the database will always stay the same. It's, it's really hard to move data and it's really simple to, to uh, refactor logic. So with this in mind, Juke is really a database first library and hence the code generation approach really helps a lot more with Juke. I realized that some other ORMs offer both ways, so they offer also a Kotlin first approach, for instance, exposed. Juke can do that as well, of course. You can always bypass code generation, but you, you're going to get the most out of Juke if you actually. I'd say I'm not an expert here, but those people I'm, projects I've worked on that have had experts have, have started from migrations because they know they're going to have to happen eventually. Yeah. And at that point, if you're starting from code first, then you're left with, well, how do I, how do I manage migrations there? Yeah. So Whereas, you could just throw away your database until you go to production, right? But from then yes. on, you immediately have to think about migrations. And if you think about it from the beginning of your project, then you already know what's going to happen when you go live. So I basically pasted this, had a little bit of a play. I'm running on a different port now, aren't I? Docker Compose said we're running on 5433. Okay, so that's going to say 5433. And this, I guess, is going to say Gilded Rose for my database. That's this one. Uh, and my user is Gilded, password is Rose. So we've got a build file that imports. And as I understand it, it should kind of, like, if I do Gradle build, it should do some stuff and that says server doesn't support SSL, so I can do there. There will be a short wait. So these warnings that you see there, just because the default example uses some features that we're probably not going to need. Right. So that's the force that's type. around these force types. That. Yes. Just so we can get somewhere. I'm going to try running all of my tests before we go on just to sort of warm everything up. Right. So we now have Duke in our class path, I guess, by dint of this plugin, yes? Uh, I don't think so. You have to add it separately. So that's oh, just okay. a Juke right. generator. That's a build time dependency. And you also have to add the compile time and runtime dependency. Okie dokie. So what am I going to have? I'm going to have an implementation. Yes. And then org juke. Org. Yeah. And then colon. The artifact is just juke. And then probably the same version as the code generation. So the latest uh, version would be um, 3.18.1. 3.18. Although uh, the code generator didn't use that version, so I'm not sure if it's up to date. Let's Maybe for this demo, let's use the same as the code generation. Okay. What it's would a that bit mean? outdated, but uh, doesn't matter for today. Yeah. Go down. I think it's, it was configured further down. No? 
Yeah, three three seventeen six. Three seventeen six. Oh, you're quicker. You're quicker to read than I am. Three seventeen. It's usually best to match the generated code version with the a runtime library version. Yes. Even if it's compatible, things are compatible. You can upgrade the runtime library and, and use the old code generator. But just to avoid any un unexpected surprises. Okay, so so actually we've done two things, and I, I kind of went went ahead of it, didn't I? Really? So we could have been playing with Duke just with this implementation. Yes. But at least now we've got something we know we can get to a database in some sort of way. I think I might commit that just to say uh, this is our getting started with. Maybe we'll amend commit as we go along. My goodness, twenty warnings. Who? Well, a Duke test seems reasonable, and then oh my goodness, Gradle. Well, commit anyway, I think, there. <laughs> uh, good, good. So, uh, Duke tests. So, we've got a test data source. Right. And, and now you can wrap that in a Duke DSL context. Okay. So, uh, let's pull in some sort of test and say the DSL context. Yes. And you, you get that by uh, using the DSL class. Mm hmm no DSL, so that's the uh, type okay. you're getting, but yep. you instantiate it with the DSL class, right? That's a single entry point for everything. It's okay. a class containing tons of static methods. And now you, instead of parentheses, you type dot using. Oh, okay, using. And mm -hmm. here you can pass the data source. And with the data source, you should probably also pass the SQL dialect, which is Postgres. So you start typing SQL dialect. Yeah, okay, IntelliJ already knows. <laughs> hey. Excellent. So this is the DSL context yeah. object. And these are the main two types you should ever use in Juke. So maybe if you assign, if you use an explicit type in your assignment, so users can see what it is. Okay. Yeah. So let's say that one. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So you see the DSL is for all static uh, DSL methods, and the DSL context is for all methods that have a data source and other configuration elements attached. And you can try it right now. So you can just type DSL context, select one, and you type one, yes. So that's a convenience method. And you fetch that, dot fetch. And if you print that, you will see the result of a query that just echoes the value one from the database. Hey, well, go for it. Yeah, that should run already. If everything's fine with your data source. Uh, and I set this up to not show passing tests, which is a bit irritating. Let me disable the plugin for Duncan. There we go. Right. So that should allow us to look at our run. And then that should stay here. We've got your lovely banner. Right. Oh, it's today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, right. It is one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's all the way to the tip of the day, like with those splash screens and uh, user interfaces. You can turn it off if, if it annoys you, but uh, for Juke starters, when people start using Juke, it's kind of useful. So uh, this was actually a query that was uh, returning the result. If you enable debug logging, you will see actual output of executing queries. So I, I guess you've turned that off. We sort of been just logging to stood out with Printland for most of the rest of the okay. Yeah, Yeah, we can work with that. So you see now we got a connection, it's working, and we can start refactoring. We can start refactoring either your database setup or, or your queries. doesn't really matter. So shall we have a look and see what the exposed version looks like? So that is in exposed and here. Okay, so I'm going to put this sort of over there somewhere so we might be able to see two sets of things at once. So I'll stop this is table. So I, I should first of all explain this the funny stuff here. I've been experimenting with Kotlin's new context receivers, which are ways that have been implicitly passing things around. Mm -hmm. And this IO is a way of marking in our code base the fact that something is an action. Basically, it's going to be doing IO and so running it in some sort of IO context, but we're just really passing an instance of something around to mark when this is used. The transaction context is more important in the case of exposed, at least, because we never really know when we're running in a transaction. This transaction block here will create a transaction, put it into a thread local for us, and mm. then it's automatically used by, by the rest of Exposed. But if we don't do that, then nothing works. So we came up with a scheme of passing around this transaction context to say, I have done that, so it's safe. Okay. 
Um, yeah, you can do that as well with Juke if you want. Juke right. isn't really a very opinionated about transactions. So the default way that people work with Juke is probably with Spring, and they will just use the Spring transactional annotations and pass a transactional data source to Juke. So Juke doesn't even know anything about transactions in, in most cases. But if you want to use the Juke transaction API, and you can, you can either use also this thread local model, Mm -hmm. uh, which is also what Spring usually does by default, or you can you can pass around the context that is transactional, just like you did here. I think maybe we'll go for that last one because a I don't know anything about Spring. Um, yeah, we don't the, we intend to use that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Me neither. Oh <laughs> uh, well, we're friends here. The the other sort of complication here is that this is a right only table. Oh, okay. And so what I've been doing is because eventually we want to event source this. So we really want to be writing events rather than anything else. But my sort of sop to that was that this table, if let's go down. So this, this in exposed is our items table. Okay. And it's sort of, it's, it's this static object thing, which is a table and it has an ID, a modified, we have items have names, have identity quality. That's all we have. And all the items that are modified at the same time have been a save. When we save all of our items, we save them all within our same last modified date. And then when we come to load, we say that we will fetch the latest last modified date. And then we will load all the items that have that same last modified date. Okay. So basically it's a way of batching everything up because we were emulating the fact that we had a tab separate file on disk. But instead of replacing items and deleting them and so on, we just save them all on mass, but batch them with, with the same modified date. One of my problems with the expose though, is that, is that I've had to do this in two queries because I couldn't work out how to do a subselect. Whereas I think all right. it, it should be, should be doable in one query. This is our schema effectively. So I'm thinking that if we've run the code generation, Duke should have already should have seen that schema. I don't know. Is that, is that yeah, you ran it before, so uh, you connected it to the database, and we should have this items object now generated somewhere. Okay, so or did you generate it too, or you could just auto complete, and then we should find it. So you think I should have items? So uh, we have sample tables to look like it, maybe. Okay, you, you took the ETN Studio's default package. Uh, okay, so target. let's try and piece that together in my mind. So we have items has magically appeared and it's magically appeared because we ran this code here. Yes. We did this, this generation, went to the database. It saw what was in this table, the one that we told it about the Gilded Rose one. And it generated Java classes that represent those things that it found. Yes. And uh, you can scroll down and you'll find the target package. Okay. So that was sort of, no uh, target. Ah, uh, there you are. Right. So if I wanted them in com gilded rows, is that where I have things? Let's have a look. Uh, yes, com gilded rows. So we should call this, I don't know what, a DB or something. And, and then this says we have build generated source Duke main. So if I was to look there, I might find a generated source Duke main. Ah, so yeah. there we go. Okay. So this is what you do because you've looked at the database and there is items, in fact. Yes. Although that's a POJO as opposed to a, a table. Ah, and the tables is here. Yeah. So this is a global object with static members where you can have all the objects you want to work with from your database and static import those things. So that's Java lingo in, in Kotlin. It's just an import. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, you can generate Kotlin code as well, but Java code works just fine. So it feels to me like I should go back and rerun our code generation. Now I've moved the package. Yes. So let's just do everything. And I guess it'll delete the old ones with it. So it'll, it'll, everything will sort of come up to date in some. Oh, yes, there you are. That answers my question. <laughs> Wonderful. So we can get rid of you and we can come here. And so this items is now. And so I, do I want the other one? Ah, yeah. Confusing. Yes, of course, because I have item is the name of my interface. <laughs> But it's also the name of the database table. Yes. But that's okay. I think I think I can cope. Do I want the tables or do I want the POJOs? Oh, uh, no, no, not the POJOs. Okay. You don't need the POJOs now. Items has a member called items. Mm -hmm. And that's the table representation. And you can just uh, run, for instance, digital contacts, select from items, and then you, get, you can fetch them. 
Okay, so let's test that really quick. Make everything in one sort of go. So, so you're saying I could say, as so I can get rid of that one, and I can say DSL context select from. Yeah, select from. You can do that in one word for our simplicity, and you see all mm -hmm. the options. So usually you use generated code here. Tend to static import the member because this repetition isn't really necessary. But yeah, and also it solves the problem that I've got two things called the same name. Yeah. And then you can fetch. Ah, uh, so of course I have to call fetch. Yeah, but if you don't, it's just a query object. It doesn't do anything. Now I'm expecting this to either be empty or just have whatever the last sort of test had lying around, right? Yeah. Let's find out. Yeah, there you go. Ah, so whatever the last test had lying around appears to be bananas and kumquat, my favorite fruit. And so that's the first query. And, and you see immediately uh, you've already auto-completed on items. This is when you want to fetch individual columns. You just add the parentheses after select. So here? No, after se after select, now you turn that into two. Ah, I see what you mean. Yes. Okay. So yeah. select, and then I'm. Now the from is uh, with a my, uh, lowercase f. Yes. So I should, I'm uh, guessing now, now I have, I, I've got to say, I, you said you wanted a guinea pig. So yeah, I'm now guessing that items. I can talk to items and find a find a column. Yeah. For instance, ID, and you see in your case, that's a string column. Yep. Uh, so that should now select just a single row for me. It's splendid. Column. Sorry. Yes. Across. So that's how Juke works. And, and you can always use auto completion. And if you migrate your schema, your Kotlin code will stop compiling because this ID object will be gone and it will be renamed, for instance, or whatever. So your, your, your Kotlin code is always in sync with the database. That makes a lot of sense to me. So in the case of exposed, I had a mapping between something that was returned from a select and my item. So just to remind me, my item class looked like this. So we have, we have an ID, we have a name, we have sell by date and quality, and this price is filled in later. So when we fetch it from the database, we don't have anything in there. And then later on, we go off to a pricing service and, and we get oh, okay. that price. So that's nullable because we might not have one. The same is true of the local date. There are some items that don't have a sell by date. They, they last forever. Mm -hmm. So I guess what it would be nice to do would be to, well, I guess I, I'm going to need to populate the database sooner or later. So shall we, can we write a test that takes an item and commits it? And then yeah, sure. we get back and see. I've got this contract that all of my other items implementations pass and I'd like to get there, but we, we can sort of back into it piece by piece. We'll avoid having to write everything all in one go. So in the meantime, my items contract has, ah, so that has an initial stop list. I'm going to copy and paste that. If we started from that, it would be nice to be able to save that. So how do I go about doing that? I've got a DSL. Let's say this is test save. I've got a DSL context. By the way, do I need to, is, is that a thing that needs to be closed at some point or? Uh, no, if you pass it a data source, then you're in, in charge of the managing okay. the data source. So every time Juke runs a query, it will fetch a connection from the data source and close it. Right. Whatever that means in terms of your data source, right? Yes. So I'm going to go to my DSL context and how do I start writing a thing? So there are various ways of running an insertion. So uh, mm -hmm. I guess you want to run an insert statement. You could just type insert into, then the table. And now usually you do this for single row inserts, right? So uh, in this case, I guess you, since you want to insert the list, you have to decide whether you want to batch insert that or just mm -hmm. run a loop in your client or run a uh, bulk insert. Tell you what we'll do. Let's have a look and see what we did for the, uh, the one we have already. And we'll match that and then work our way out. So right. this here has save, and it looks like we did insert individually. Okay. So let's go with that here. So that's certainly not the fastest way to do it, but uh, no. it's certainly feasible. So you can loop over your items. So we're going to say initial stock list, probably just be able to loop over each one. Uh, so that's item. And then I'm going to say insert into items. When you specify the columns you want to insert uh, into. And is this a list at this point? 
it's an overload of uh, various var arcs. Uh, so you can have okay. type safe insertion. So you just specify the three columns you have here. Do I'm going to, is there an easy way of seeing the entire columns from here? Yeah, um, it's right down on, on the bottom of the screen now. If you use an outline in, in IntelliJ, you will see them. Ooh. It's probably the best. Now you did a full screen structure. Yeah, structure. I mean, I'm an Eclipse user, so ah, it's called it outline there, but uh, structure <laughs> is the thing. So you see it there, right? <laughs> Let's just remember, we've got items ID, and that's not happy there for some reason. Or what do I need to give it? Oh, no, you, you, you now pass that to the t where you had the table before. You have to pass that to the columns method. Ah, okay. Insert, ah, right. Insert into item. So this is items.id and then more, 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 more. Yeah, you know which ones. Uh, I'm not sure which ones these are. Uh, items. items dot, last uh, modified uh, date? Uh, modified. Modified. Item okay. name. I think we decided that, ah, quality is the other one because we don't have a price. Uh, item type is sort of pulled out of the ether. So we go back here and we'll say item dot. Quality, and then this being SQL, irritatingly, list of names, list of values, right? Yeah, you know, pass the values. You can also use the MySQL syntax if you prefer that, where you write set instead of columns and values. You can show it yeah. afterwards. Yes. So values, this is going to be item dot ID, item dot item dot modified. Ah, so now we have an interesting question. We don't have that because that's not part of our item itself. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So we'll say to do in there. Then we've got item dot name, item dot quality. So what is quality? It's an enum? Uh, it's an int, I think. An int? Uh, uh, let's find out. It's a quality and a quality is a non-negative oh, value class. You can actually uh, bind the value class to your coach generator if you want. Right. Maybe later on. So you have type safety also on this level if right. you ever use these types. I, so I, my belief is that the Java should just see this as int and everything, at least for now, should be fine. But yes, that's interesting. Uh, so I've forgotten items dot sell by. And so that needs to go in here, item dot sell by date. And we now have an issue with to do. And the issue is that that type isn't the same as this date, I guess. So we need to be doing this in the context of some sort of time. So let's say uh, now it's instant now and can i pass now into there now so that they all have the same date it's not an instant okay it's so default. what do I... so I, i'm guessing this is a local date time so you use timestamp in the database ah yes okay so in fact that should be local date time now yeah you can always influence the types of generated code in, in your code generator if, if they don't match your expectations but that but neatly showed that it wasn't so. compiling because we had the wrong type, but now it's compiled. Now it's not compiling for some other reason. Can you, can you show it again? Mm. Try, try passing the int directly. Can you un unbox this? Uh, yes. So that's value int there. This that name I think good. is value is a string. Cell by date ID is. <laughs> Uh, also value, which is irritating, the also value. <laughs> okay, yeah. so. so so this can all be fixed if you set up the code generator correctly, right? So if you want right. to use the domain types in your in your item class, we can match those types in the code generator. But if you don't, then you have to already, I guess, I'm out of my uh, comfort zone here with Kotlin, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I guess you have to explicitly do that when the API is a Java API. I, I mean, I'm already having to do that, I suppose, when I'm when I'm reading and writing from disk. Yeah. So it's not it's not too much of a problem. But yes, one of the things I suppose that after a while it will irritate and you'll find a way to solve it. But in the meantime, yeah. we just get something running. You can add a to do here to maybe fix this. Um, so now, before we continue, the query doesn't execute yet, so you all have to type execute in the end. Okay, That's so like you did fetch with the previous one. So. Yes. Fetch means you actually expect a result. Execute is just the update count when you change data. That should Wonderful. be it. So I'm just going to run this for instant gratification with hopefully. Uh, so something happened. And in fact, oh, because we were already doing the items ID, we should see a bunch of items, right? Yeah, you should see the new ones. And there we are. Uh, B1. So we haven't cleared out the table, I suppose. So we're just getting more. And oh, more yeah. Stuff. 
you want to do that when you set up? Uh, let's, yes. yes, let's do that if we can. So we'll say uh, before each player DB, say. Now the question is where you want to put the DSL context object. So usually you probably don't put that in every test. So you have one for everyone. Yeah, but I don't so know how you want to set up your, your uh, test suite. So that's. So let's cross that bridge when we come to it. Yeah. But for, for now, this is safe, you say, effectively. So, so you can just delete or truncate the items table. Okay. So we'll DSL say context. truncate. Oops. No, and append execute. I'm getting there. Good, good. Uh, so if I run that, we should see only two items, a banana and a kumquat, but we should see the, the two IDs for those. And there, there they you are. go. Okay. Perfect. So, well, it feels like we're sort of getting close. So now it would be nice to say this was test, save, and load, right? Remind me again what you want to do in one step. Save and um, load, and you want to fetch the generated values? or Yeah, so at some point, we want to fetch the values that have been inserted only by the latest insert, basically. So where this now goes in, we push in a batch. But for now, I think I'm happy to say, because we cleared the database, let's see whether we can get back our initial stock list somehow. Okay. So we sort of had this thing. So I'm going to take a punt. I'm going to say we said, so selected everything. That was right. And I do kind of want everything. Mm -hmm. So I fetch and now I can map that into something, I guess. Yes. Okay. And what's this? This is a record mapper. So what in here? Now currently you don't have any type safety because you didn't pass any parameters, any arguments to select. If you ah, okay. pass the columns, then you would get the columns. Right. The type safe right. way. So I'm going to, for now at least, I guess I can just take this thing and put it into there, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to say select those from items, fetch. There. And you can see the type now. It's a record five, yep. which you hardly ever type out. But uh, with, with a type inference, you can <laughs> now access those things. And it's also it, coupled and enabled. It has component one to five objects, so you can destructure. Oh, I see. So I could going. destructure it in here. Yeah. Uh, does that sort of just happen? Is, is that a thing that IntelliJ does for me? Oh, that would oh, be great. Annoying, no. isn't it? Um, never mind. Let's 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 live without it for now. Okay. So uh, I can say I want an item, and the ID is going to be record. Uh, you can uh, act, uh, use Kotlin Accessor syntax. So this so can be items uh, ID. Items dot ID. So I thought I had imported items, but let's wonder why that is not. I'm just trying to avoid having to type ID. I want everything. Okay. By hand, Duncan. Items <laughs> dot star. No items. Uh, these aren't uh, static objects. Uh, okay. Item. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. That makes sense to me. But you could use a. Uh, um, what is it in Kotlin? Apply or whatever? No. Oh, with, yeah. With. I see. Uh, actually, apply, with apply with equally. Then. Yeah. Right. I, I'm going to have a little bit of like a type safety headache here for a moment. So um, I'm just going to say that this is my ID type. And oh, yes. I need to say that I'm going to go in. So that will be a string, naturally. But unfortunately, this actually this returns a nullable version in case it not non-blank because yeah, I was on a bit of a type safe kick at the time. So we go here and we're going to say that. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's let's work our way into this. We'll say this is a variable which is ID. That's good. So the next thing we need is bring item over here so we can see it. So we need a name. So you're saying that name is going to come from items dot name and that's going to be a non-blank string on that thing. Good. And and you had a, a very persuasive discussion around nullability and how you can't yeah. really just <laughs> We're avoiding that right now because you're still using the Java generator, right? So right. The Java generator will generate only platform types in Kotlin, which are mm -hmm. probably better suited for uh, SQL interactions. If you want, I can elaborate, but let, let, let me cope with what I can, which is not a great deal. 
Uh, so this is my sell by date, but yes, I was trying to remember to provide a link in the description because I thought it was a, a, it was a very good interview, wasn't it? Uh, yes, your discussion about how nullability through SQL is is practically impossible to trace, I thought was was very persuasive. I've seen so, actually I've seen a similar product like Juke in TypeScript, and TypeScript's uh, generics are Turing complete, for, to my understanding, and that means um, you can encode any sort of type system with uh, with those generics, and they actually managed to at least for very simple cases, solve the problem that you probably can never solve in, in the JVM. So the problem is when you have a left join, for example, you think your ID is uh, non-nullable, but as soon as you left join the ID, it becomes nullable again, and there's hardly any way to detect this unless you change the syntax of the query. And Juke really strives of uh, modeling the whole SQL syntax in a one-to-one -one basis. Which is a trade-off, of course, but that means it's it's almost impossible to correctly model nullability. You see, my, my SQL kind of stops at joins. I, at sub sub select where's <laughs> work for me, but in and out of joins, like I have people to do that for me. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, some homework. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, Juke will. Uh, That's true, actually. Help yes. you uh, having actually, having a typeface API to make it so that I understood what was coming and going would be very good for me. Actually, there's this uh, feature in Juke called implicit join. So if you want to join from the child entity to a parent one, you don't oh, actually have to join. Cool. Yes. Do you have any foreign keys in your database already? Uh, no? Not yet. Not I, yet. I mean, I have ambitions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if we're right uh, while we were talking, then this should be, well, a, a mutable list of items, I guess, because it's just talking to Java at this point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Kotlin is perfectly happy to say that's just a list of items. Yeah, that's all good. So we could we could actually write our first proper test at least, couldn't we, by saying assert equals that should be the same, huh? Yeah. So I'm thinking that our our initial stock list uh, items should be the same as the items we've just fetched, mm -hmm. and import that from someplace. Okay. Are you feeling lucky? Well, that should work. At least Splendid. it should work. That is. Uh, Duke tickets today. Good, good. And just so I know, is that the same tip every day or is it a different tip every time I run? About a 50 different tips. <laughs> every time you run, there's a, a new one. <laughs> Duke doesn't store any, any data on your uh, system or telemetry or whatever. So uh, it wouldn't I, be possible for Duke to remember which tip is already displayed. I think the mid 90s, I worked on what was a sort of last generation of SunOS machines with a, with a friend of mine who was a Unix hacker. And I used to have my C shell prompt to bring up a Unix fortune as a tradition at the time. You know, when you logged in, you got a Unix fortune. And I started getting some really weird, weird ones. And I'd got to the stage where I'd like decompiled the Unix fortunes dat file and was gripping in that to find the fortune that just came up and, and they weren't in there. <laughs> and, and it turns out that at some point I'd given my login details to a friend and he had aliased fortune to his own script <laughs> that every now and again, randomly inserted. <laughs> Fortunes from his own list into my right. fortune. And the one that gave it away in the end was I got a unique fortune when I logged in, which was metaphorically speaking, you have given me the wool to pull over your own eyes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We are, we're doing pretty well, actually. I think let's just recap what we've done. We have selected these bits. We've got a record and we've used that record in a type safe sort of way to reconstruct an item. We could, I suppose, take this and make a method out of it. This would be two item. And then I could say, make that a receiver. And then we'd get record to item, which would be nice, right? And then I could take that thing and say, that's really sort of part of my production code. That's a thing that I want to be using. Yeah, I don't know. Now you, you're tying the structure list type record five string local date to uh, an item. But it could be any other random projections. I'm not sure if this is really, it's up to you. I, I guess it's a matter of uh, application design. Okay. Um, the, the, the type that you get here is really not connected to the query anymore. Yeah. So you, I see. You, what you, I'm not guaranteed that it yeah. contains items. But I mean, if you, if you know you're always going to uh, project yeah. all the columns, then uh, we can go back. I think this will end up this this will end up as private probably in yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but even then i mean if you're if you know that you're projecting all the columns which mm -hmm. i think you did in this case uh this yes is, you could run a select from items query 
without the projection, and then you get an items record if you generated that. Ah, right. Okay. And so it's more type safe. It's uh, up to you. I mean, we're also yeah. just showing what's possible right now. So maybe in a later section, you'll so, refer to so, this again. Okay. I, I have an ambition. And my ambition is to say that I created a stock list and the stock list has the last modified. And so I really want to be saying, I want to fetch not just these items. Oh but, yeah, I get it. Uh, but I want to fetch the stock list. Now, when I get this right, it should be that every item that I have has the same last modified because that's this batch. So I could kind of, at this point, I think I should be able to say that providing I've got any items that I can say my loaded stock list is a stock list. The last modified of, ha ha, okay. We have an issue around instance that we will have to solve some sort of way. But with the last modified of whatever that time was, uh, effectively items first to instant. Ah, oh, no, you I've defined not, the I've instant type of your yeah. query. Yes. Okay. So, so let's not we do that first. That. Let's so do that first. The, yes. So let's go to the um, code generation configuration. But that's in my Gradle file. Gradle. Here we go. Yeah. And now you, you uncomment one of the first types and change it. So we already have these examples. Okay. You have to change instant. You can delete one of them. And the other one, include types would be instant then. Oh no, the name would be instant and the include types timestamp. 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 And the include expression, you could list columns here if you want. If this doesn't apply to all the timestamp columns, then you can list them here as a regular expression. That, that should be fine. Okay, so is, is include expression the right thing there? Yeah, or you can omit it as well. Okay, while stab in the dark, I'm going to build and see what happens. Okay, that's probably failed that test, I suppose. Uh, yeah, you can compile yeah, that yeah. as well because okay. that's what we wanted. So now we've got the, this should be instant now, is that right? Yeah. I would say and so. And and your uh, your uh, utility method is now also for, uh, wrong to to item oh. function ah, capture. Yes, yeah. Okay, there are two things going on here. The sell by date is not the same as the last modified. Yeah, sell by date is not a local instant, date right? time, so that's instant. But in fact, we don't need that. We don't need the last modified in order to resurrect an item. The last modified is a property of the stock list that contains all the items, not the items themselves. So what we need to do now is we need to go to our database because we saved each item with this modified with the value of now. So we need to select the latest set of saved items that all had the same saved yeah, yeah, set of work clause, right? right? Yeah. And then we need to pull all those back in one go. And then we can use that value as the timestamp for our stock list. So mm -hmm. I do this work like bit by bit and then we can work out how to do the subselect is that you just need to subselect right now no okay in which case we're selecting from items and i sort of want to say here where is that right yes well there are uh, multiple ways it depends how you want to do it with a postgres you can also use distinct on but that's a bit more fancy in terms of sql but you want to use a subquery right so the subquery wants to be max of Items modified. Yes. So you write where items modified equals. So where items dot modified. Yep. And you just type dot e inside of the where clause. And here you write the subquery. Okay. You just start typing select. Yeah, that's the one. So you see it's type safe. You have to yep. have a subquery with a lowercase select. So and that's a. Uh, Oh, okay. So we have a different select on the auto completion path. That's not jokes. You need uh, DSL select. So that is going to be my DSL context at this point. No DSL. Okay. You don't need it uh, from the context. Hey, oh, we're getting somewhere. Okay. So I now need to say select items modified. You need the max items modified, right? Yes. Is that a max in here? Oh, okay. Oh no, no I just need to choose chooks, right? So there are a lot of max. <laughs> so many max. Is that again, we're going to have to pull it from DSL? If you find it, you just 
Autoclave, you can import all the DSL methods if you want. DSL max items dot modified. Oh, is that it? No, you have to uh, add a from clause. Ah, okay. So at this point, the SQL engine doesn't know where that column is from. So equals select and uh, there. Yeah, right there. From items. Yeah, that should be it. Hey, okay. well, I'm going to run it because nothing should have gone worse. Which is true. Well, I which should is get the same rule. <laughs> Now, the issue is that I need to get out that modified. It's going to be the same in all these items. Yes. But I've lost it in this map, right? No, so, you, you projected it, no? Yes, but I lost it because all I put out here was an item that last modified isn't a property of our item class when we're here. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to finesse that by saying this is going to be... So that's my record. So I can say record items... But you do fetch it. I do fetch it. I just need to remember it somehow. Uh, I think you get it in a minute. Ah, yeah, uh, like this. So basically, I'm going to do that. That's close, but no cigar. Why is that? Pair of instant item. Oh, it's not a list item now. It's a list of pairs, no? Oh, idiot. Yes, thank you. This is why we pair. <laughs> <laughs> Find the right pairs. <laughs> yeah, we pair in order to work out that we need a list of pairs. So nasty hack, but basically we can say last modified is my items first. You did, you still didn't need it. I mean, it's, it's in the item, right? Yes. But when I've done this map, this is what I'm saying. This map yeah. throws it away. This instant isn't used in here because in my item, I never have a last. Oh modified. yeah. In the item. Yes. Yeah. So I've, I've lost it that way. Now I could be really cheeky and like I could yeah. have a, a variable in here. And every time I go in here, I could update that variable, but I'd have to hand in my functional programmer's badge. It took me an awful long time to get that functional programmer's badge. I'm not throwing it away by using a variable at this point. Uh, <laughs> well, you could run the entire nest query in Juke. Juke could nest all that stuff for you. Would it? Um, yeah. Would be a bit more complicated for a beginner query, but uh, oh, you can do everything with you. I'm, I'm going to go with what I can cope with. So that is my last modified, I figure. So, and now my initial stock list, I can rebuild a stock list. So that uses the last modified and it uses my items map it first. Oh, sorry, second. Not a second. There you go. Ah, you spoke too soon. Okay, what do we have? Stock list. So, oh, there's a very, very different. What have we messed up then? So we expected a stock list with, ah, okay. Oh, but you inserted now. Yeah, so that is, so that is actually kind of right, isn't it? So in fact, it shouldn't be now. This should be the last modified of the stock list, right? That's, yeah. our, that's our kind of definition at this point. So what we really wanted here was initial stock list, last modified. That's why we write tests. That's why we write tests. So the tests can have bugs. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed part one of my pairing with Lucas. In part two, we will refactor what we have into the same shape as our existing repository class and also compare the library's approaches. If you'd like to see that, please subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like the look of Duke, and I think you definitely should, there is a link in the show notes. That's also where you'll find details of the book that are open at that price called Java to Kotlin, a refactoring guidebook. Thanks for watching.